all right so today we have taken these articles for our discussion and uh, today also we have uh, we are you know experimenting with this live class of dns let's see uh, whether you have better clarity with respect to understanding of the topics so uh, today we have taken these important topics from the hindu and also one article from indian express so uh, as you can see the topics are uh, regarding bricks here in this article we will discuss about the fault line or the geopolitical fault line with respect to institutions favored by the global north and institutions favored by the global south so this is more or less the crux of this particular article this one the smartphone manufacturing in india the counter argument now here there are two things which we will discuss first is the pli scheme and the counter argument which has been given by the ex rbi governor dr raghuram rajan now that counter argument is also necessary to understand if in case a question is asked regarding the critical analysis of pli scheme particularly with respect to the smartphones now i am sure you have gone through the news where uh, you have read that the production of iphone 15 has started in india so on that note this uh, this news which has appeared which has appeared in the text and context section also becomes very important then this article deep in this array here we will discuss very uh, from a prelim centric point of view about article 174 and also the fact that nebam rabia judgment as we all know which was a five judge constitution bench judgment has been further referred by the chief justice of india in this in the recently concluded the sif shena crisis case and uh, some aspects of nebam rabia judgment will also be further looked into now here this article mentions about the increasing deficit about with india and asean countries regarding their trade and this article talks about fixing holes in financial safety net now this fixing holes is basically the we all know that when countries go bankrupt or required financial fusion in term with respect to their balance of payment crisis then they generally go to imf but of late there has been a trend that there are other institutions where countries are resorting to including bilateral swap agreement so we will see all these features so let's start our discussion with this first article now it says the brics test for india's multipolarity rhetoric now as we all know that today the brics summit has started in south africa and uh, interestingly the author has highlighted the crux of this entire article in this one paragraph where he says that the challenge before new delhi is to choose between china centric or a west centric world order now this china centric or west centric world order it is here where the fault line has been created and this world order is with respect to the institutions now when we talk about west or the developed world the institutions created by the west or the developed world particularly after the second world war includes un and its affiliate organizations including unsc world trade organization imf world bank and similar other organization when we talk about the institutions of the global south then here we are talking about asean countries bimstec or shanghai cooperation organization or more recently brics now south africa was the last country to join and with reference to this a question was asked way back in 2014 so a question can be expected next year as the brics summit is taking place now so the question asked in 2014 was with reference to a grouping of countries known as brics consider the following statements first the first summit of brics was held in rio de janeiro in 2009 second south africa was the last to join the brics grouping which of the statements given above is are correct 
So from this question, what we understand is that obviously we need to understand about BRICS as an organization or as an institution and also its role in the changing world order or in the changing geopolitical world order. So this topic overall becomes important from the perspective of GS paper 2, particularly bilateral, regional and global groupings and agreements involving India or affecting India's interest. Now, obviously, in BRICS, India's interest is very much aligned with that of these institutions of Global South, right? And it provides a very good opportunity for India to counterbalance India's so-called absence, particularly in the West-dominated institutions, particularly the United Nations Security Council. However, the challenge is not that. As India has a decent representation in both institutions or institutions from both sides. However, the challenge is the balance. How India will balance the institutions from the global north and institutions from the global south. And it is here where the author highlights that this challenge can work both ways, that is positively and also negatively. How it can work positively is that it can act as a bridge. So, India can actually provide a bridge between these two sides or these two worlds or in a negative way, it can impact India. Because if we look at all these institutions or most of these institutions, then you see that two major countries are there. These are China and Russia, right? And both China and Russia, they have in a way realigned their global interest in the changing scenario, particularly with respect to United States of America and also their various policies, including their policies in the Middle East. So, when China and Russia combines their geopolitical interest, it is where that India starts getting impacted. So, India started looking east or rather acting east so as to also to expand its footprint in the Southeast Asian region and also in the South Pacific region. But at the same time, along with this, India is also very much a part of Quad, where which also includes or involves the United States of America. Now, India is a part, India is a key member of BRICS and also India is a key member of Quad. This is where the challenge lies and this is what has been highlighted in this article. Because both sides see each other in a very antagonizing manner, not in a friendly manner. And it is here, talking in a negative context, that India may suffer because both sides will not, you know, will see India in a suspicious way. And this is where, in, this is where problems may arise or the geopolitical fault line may increase. So again, it can act both ways. The bridge that connects the two so-called global south and global north as highlighted in this article, it can, India can either provide that bridge or in other way, this can further destabilize India or India while pursuing its international policy based on its national interest, its national interest might get jeopardized. So let's understand how the author in this article has highlighted this issue. I hope uh, I hope it is clear so far. So moving ahead. Now this look at this statement. This statement is very important and a statement based question like this can appear or can be asked by UPSC in your mains examination. The question is suppose this is the question. The statement is, it is better to have imperfect institution than one hegemonic imperfection. For example, one hegemonic imperfection, let's say United Nations Security Council. And we know that India is eyeing or vying for a permanent seat in the UNSC. 
So the author says that it serves global governance better and in a more democratic manner. So there are few terms mentioned here. Mentioned here. One is global governance. One is multipolarity. If you go through the article, you will find these terms. Multipolarity and also the dollarization. Now all these terms becomes important to understand here because these terms actually help us to understand the crux or the fault line. Now global governance as we say, so it says that it is better that there are number of institutions like you know there are 25 multilateral institutions rather than just one imperfect institution because these different institutions gives space for emerging economies to voice their concerns or voice their own aspects, voice their own issues. And hence, other than these institutions, institutions like ASEAN, BRICS, Shanghai Cooperation Organization are also very much important from the perspective of multipolar world order. Right. So, First of all, let's go through these terms as I mentioned here because these terms will help us understand the problems which has been highlighted by the author regarding this problem of balance that how India will balance both sides. So de-dollarization is basically the reverse of dollarization as you know that dollar is basically the main currency of exchange in exchange rates and also in terms of usage. So, de-dollarization is the global move to resist and reverse dollarization. The problem here is that, yes, India would also look forward for de-dollarization. But the question is that, rather than dollar, whom are we strengthening? Other than dollar, are we strengthening the yuan or the Chinese currency? Then, in other way, we are directly playing directly into the hand of China or entering into the Chinese trap of strengthening their yuan. So this becomes a problem. So we cannot directly go for de-dollarization because it ultimately strengthens yuan. Another term global governance. So it says can be understood as a framework of institutions. So it is a framework of institutions and that's why multipolar institutions or number of institutions are necessary rather than just one institution or one global institution. So it's a framework of institutions, rules, norms, procedures that facilitate collective action and cooperation among countries and other actors. And these institutions basically act as a platform where all countries, developed countries, developing countries, underdeveloped countries can voice their concern. And this voicing of concern should be inclusive, should be equitable, and should be representative in nature. That is what India aspires for. And that is why India traditionally is not in favor of these competing blocks. Yet, India has, India favors or tries to be a part of all these emerging blocks. Then, the issue of multipolarity. Now, this refers to the geopolitical situation that arises when several power centers balance each other out. For example, USA balancing out China or India balancing out some other country. And this term is used to describe what happens when no, no one nation state has overwhelming power over the others. Because one or the other can checkmate the other country. So, So, as of now, we are living in a multipolar world order, particularly after the Second World War. So, these terms are important and based on the understanding of these terms, the author has highlighted that the fault line creating problems for India, the fault line with respect to the institutions of the Global North and institutions of the Global South. So, the problems highlighted for India with respect to this fault line the first point is rise of competing blocks in international system. And this rise of competing blocks have 
has further impacted India's interest because India at times is pulled on both sides. For example, if you take Quad, then the United States of America wants Quad more as a military alliance. And this question has also been asked by UPSC. And we, if we talk about Shanghai Cooperation Organization or say BRICS, then it provides an opportunity for other countries or countries of the global south to counterbalance this world order. So this, this is one of the problems highlighted in this article. Another one is China and Russia aligning their global interests, especially with respect to ASEAN, SEO, BRICS. This is a problem. And the problem has been highlighted through CEPA and BRI. And India, if, as I said, that India is being pulled on both sides. But ultimately, if you, if you look at the center or at the balance, then ultimately, in all these institutions, China and Russia are aligning their global interest. And that is causing further problems for India. And in the process, India unwantedly or as a part of its strategy, maybe, is also moving towards the West. It further says that India has traditionally opposed creation of blocks, yet competing blocks against equitable global governance and multipolarity is the norm now. And even India, despite its traditional resistance, is part of or member of most of these institutions. It further says that India's pursuit for multipolar world de-dollarization and alternative global forum may jeopardize India's national interest because ultimately multipolar world order or India's pursuit for de-dollarization as stated may further strengthen China and its currency. This is the problem. The problem of balance. So the author has highlighted these problems with respect to this fault line or geopolitical fault line and and the author has concluded by saying that it's very difficult for India to find that balance despite this India has to find this balance yet or it might get caught in the Chinese trap because if it does not favor de-dollarization or it if it favors de-dollarization then ultimately it is strengthening yuan and when both China and uh, Russia are aligning their interest, then obviously it becomes difficult for India to operate or function in such an environment. So, look into this question asked by UPSC in the mains of 2019. The question was, what introduces friction into the ties between India and the United States is that Washington is still unable to find for India a position in its global strategy which would satisfy India's national self-esteem and ambitions. Explain with suitable examples. The question carried 15 marks. So some of these fault lines could become a part of this answer. And that is why United States is, and that is why this question was actually asked. Based on similar lines, questions can be asked from this topic and this topic uh, is a very important topic from your mains perspective. I hope the crux of this article is clear to you, right? So let's move to the next article. Okay, this is another very interesting article on PLI, that is production linked incentive. How many of you are clear about this PLI scheme or have you heard about the PLI scheme? Okay, let's look into this question. 
this topic actually. So this topic says that on smartphone manufacturing in India. Now PLI scheme is basically to boost manufacturing in India, right? And the PLI scheme, particularly for uh, smartphone and electronic equipments, has helped India to, you know, become <clears throat> or become less import dependent. Now this is a this is a data with respect to import or export of smartphones. For the year 2017-18, if you look here, the import of smartphone was worth 3.6 billion dollars, whereas the export was 334 million dollar only. Just see the comparison between import and export way back in 2017-18. 22-23, the import has reduced drastically to 1.6 billion dollars and export has skyrocketed exponentially to 11 billion dollars thanks to production link incentive scheme now this scheme has helped the manufacturing of smartphones in india as the name itself suggests production linked incentive the more you produce the more you sell in a particular year the government will provide you certain incentive that incentive will be based on certain thresholds but for that you have to produce in india and then export or sell so it says that around 5 years ago the government of india decided that it wanted more companies to make things in india it has therefore introduced a key set of incentives through the production linked incentive scheme here the government gives money to foreign or domestic companies that manufacture goods here so basically it's an incentive to those companies which manufactures certain products and this incentive uh, production link incentive scheme is uh, applicable to both domestic companies and global companies or foreign companies depending on the criteria as provided by the government now the article is regarding the counter provided by dr raghuram raj now i have said that pli scheme boost manufacturing on the other hand dr raghuram rajan has highlighted that it it does not boost manufacturing it only boost importing or import of those products let's understand what dr raghuram rajan has said he has said that suppose this is a mobile phone and this mobile phone has say 20 different components of which it is made of these 20 components according to him 15 just take an example a hypothetical example 15 out of those 20 components are imported so what he actually says is that this pli scheme particularly for the smartphone is not make in india but is rather assembling in india so this is the counter narrative provided by Dr. Raghuram Rajan and this is what has been highlighted here that Dr. RBI, former RBI governor contends that while imports of fully put together mobile phones have come down, the imports of mobile phone components have shot up between first financial year 21 and 23 as the scheme started in 2020. So this is the counter argument provided by Dr. Raghuram Rajan. Now to understand the counter argument, let's understand certain basics with respect to the PLI scheme. I hope uh, so far it's clear to you. Okay, uh, this topic, uh, as you can see, a question was asked in the prelims of 2023. Just let's go through the question. The question is, consider the following statements. Statement 1. India accounts for 3.2% of global export of goods. Again, data oriented question, statistics oriented question. Statement 2. Many local companies and some foreign companies operating in India have taken advantage of India's production linked incentive scheme. So, to understand this or to answer this question, 
we need to understand certain basics with respect to the production linked incentive scheme. Okay, so let's understand the process. What actually happens is that suppose the government wants to provide the production linked inten intensive scheme uh, in a particular sector, say mobile phone. And if you are uh, seeing the news, then I'm sure you have gone through that uh, there was a news recently that the manufacturing of iPhone 15 starts in India. And the, I think uh, it is provided by Foxconn, the components. Anyways, the government, the start of it, it happens is that the government invite bids from companies in specific sectors to be part of the PLI scheme. And this bid is based on certain threshold, certain criteria. For example, let's say, say the criteria is turnover. Just taking as an example, so it's possible that the turnover for say domestic company is say rupees 100 crore annually and a turnover for a foreign company or a global company is say rupees 1000 crore. So this is the difference in threshold criteria. Then the government imposes certain criteria such as annual turnover. Now this may differ for global and domestic company as I have stated here. And based on this, the government chooses certain companies. So suppose uh, let's take the smartphone sector. Suppose the government chooses three foreign companies and two domestic companies, right? And then government lays down criteria with respect to investment and sales for five year period. Now this is important to understand. So that the criteria would be as such. It talks about investment and sales. So how much is the is that company investing? And how much are they selling that product? And this investment or sale will be checked year wise. That is how much in the first year, how much in the second year, third year, fourth year and so on in the fifth year. And based on both these components of investment and sale, the government, if that threshold is crossed, then the government will provide certain incentive. I'll give you an example. Suppose the global company is to invest rupees 1 crore annually and it has to make sale of the product worth rupees 5 crores right so this is the threshold and if it does so above the threshold the government will provide 6% based on certain fixed parameter or on a base year. Similarly for second year threshold, third year threshold, fourth year threshold and fifth year threshold. Right? And the company actually invest say rupees 1.5 crores. And by investing rupees 1.5 crores, it is able to manufacture so many of mobile phones that it is able to sell mobile phone worth rupees 7 crores. So the threshold has been crossed. Now they are liable for incentive. But for liable for incentive, that is the government will only give incentive under the scheme when both these threshold for investment and sale is crossed year by year. This is the PLI scheme basically. So the idea is to boost manufacturing within the country. Is it clear so far? I hope I'm not going fast since most of you uh, commented yesterday that, you know, sir, uh, it was a bit slow. Are you able to understand in this live format much better or no? Is it, am I giving you, am I able to give you more clarity with respect to any topic? Just let me know in the comment section. Okay, so this I have taken from the government, uh, the rules with respect to the PLI scheme for mobile phones. Now look here, I want to highlight this part here. Mobile phones here, year 
in incremental investment over base year and incremental sales of manufactured over goods over base year and this value is different if you compare with domestic companies see domestic companies let's look at the question what was asked by upsc to have have the perspective okay Statement 1, India accounts for 3.2% of global exports of goods. So, this statement is incorrect as I think it is close to 1.8% or something. Second, many local companies and some foreign companies, look at the term, many local companies and some foreign companies operating in India have taken advantage of India's production linked incentive scheme. Statement 2 is correct, statement 1 is incorrect. I think according to this statement 1 is incorrect, but statement 2 is correct. So, D is the correct answer. here. See, it's all about understanding the basics, the concepts. That helps both in your prelims and it also will help you in writing if a question is asked in the mains examination. Clear? Okay, after understanding uh, this, the PLI scheme, let's go through the counter argument provided by Dr. Raghuram Rajan. So, he says that, as I have stated, that it has increased imports of those parts like camera, semiconductor, printed circuit boards, whatever the components are used in the mobile phone, the screen, the display. So, all those components are imported and this, these are then assembled and a mobile phone is produced. So, he says that import of parts used in phones increase substantially and overall he says that this has not helped manufacturing at all as the claim by the government. So, he says that this assembling of these different components based on which a mobile phone is then assembled. This has led to assemble in India rather than make in India. So, this is the major counter argument provided here. Now, all these counter arguments can be used with respect to critical analysis of this scheme for mobile phones if it is asked. So, it says that India has become more import dependent for such products, semiconductors, displays, cameras, batteries, all the products or all the aspects, the things which are used in a mobile phone. So, he says that it is merely assembling of those products and for that they have to import. So, the import dependency as such has not reduced, maybe for the phone overall, but not for those electronic equipments or the equipments used in the phone. Now, there is another example provided by Dr. Raghuram Rajan, where he says that this scheme has become very cost effective for the companies and he has given an example. He says that the say, suppose, an hypothetical example, suppose the price of an iPhone is rupees 100 and the assembly cost for the company is only rupees 4, where government under PLI scheme pays rupees 6. So, it is a win-win situation for the company. So, this is what the argument or rather the counter argument against the PLI scheme is. He further says that value added as percentage of GDP of manufacturing, since the whole idea, the whole crux of PLI scheme is to promote manufacturing in the country or make in India scheme. He says that value added as percentage of manufacturing sector was lowest in 10 years at the end of 2022 based on the World Bank report. So, he is saying that manufacturing as such, particularly in the mobile phone sector, has not improved and this has also impacted supply chain. He further raised questions on performance of the scheme in adding value to the manufacturing ecosystem, particularly to the supply chain of manufacturing. 
and says that absence of localization of key products in smartphone manufacturing because those key products which are used in the smartphone are actually imported from other countries. So as such no manufacturing as such is taking place and it says that lack of manufacturing does not create the multiplier effect on economy as the supply chain is missing. Now manufacturing is said to create a multiplier effect because once you manufacture something then that components is not only manufactured but then it is sold in the market it is further utilized so there is a cascading effect so because of the fact that manufacturing is actually not taking place so the multiplier effect which should have happened has not happened or is not happening so this is the counter argument suggested or provided by dr ravram rajan now the government said that when china started their <clears throat> manufacturing of the smartphones there it also started in the same way and slowly it, it picked up and then and now they are they are a booming economy with respect to export of smartphones so the government says that this is a process where we actually are assembling first and then slowly we'll start manufacturing all those products so this is what the article is all about here you need to know about the pli scheme and also the counter argument provided by Dr. Raghuram Raj. Any doubt in this article so far? And a question was also asked in the prelims examination this year. Okay. Moving further to this question. Any doubts so far? You can ask your doubts, not a problem. Okay, moving ahead, this article, uh, it appears on page number one and also on in the editorial section. Now, this article basically says that no governor's assent, Manipur assembly session, a non-starter. Here we need to know about article 174 as uh, according to article 174, it talks about as a <clears throat> session of state assembly and article 85 on a similar note talks about sessions of parliament and a uh, question was also asked in the prelims of 2020 with respect to sessions of parliament so on that note we need to know about sessions of state assembly also now two things obviously we need to know article 174 and uh, 85 another thing is that the question is whether this decision of the governor to convene a session is it their discretionary power or is it has to be done on based on the aid and advice of the council of ministers what is it let me know in the chat box So, uh, first of all, let's take up this question asked in the prelims of 2020. Now, look into this question. It says, consider the following statements. First, the President of India can summon a session of the parliament at such place as he or she thinks fit. Second, the Constitution of India provides for three sessions of parliament in a year but it is not mandatory to conduct all the three sessions. So very clearly you have to know the elements of article 174 and also article 85 of the constitution of India. And third, there is no minimum number of days that the parliament is required to meet in a year. Can you tell me the answer in the comment section? And then we'll discuss these two provisions. First of all, since we have taken this question, let's take up article 85. So it says that the president shall from time to time summon each house of the parliament to meet as such time and place 
as he thinks fit. Now look at the statement. UPSC directly lifts that statement from the constitutional provision. But six months shall not intervene between its first sitting and last sitting. And in one session and the date appointed for its first sitting in the next session. It then says that the president may from time to time prorogue the house or either houses and dissolve the house of the people. Similarly, on similar note, Article 174 says the same thing. Sessions of the state legislature, prorogation and dissolution. The governor shall from time to time summon the house or each houses of the legislature of the state to meet at such time and place as he thinks fit. But six months shall not intervene between its last sitting in one session and the date appointed for its first sitting in the next session. And in the constitution bench judgment of Nibam Rabia and Bamang Felix versus the speaker, the Supreme Court has stated that this decision of speak, uh, governor or the president has to be taken with respect to summoning of session based on the advice of Council of Ministers. This has been clearly highlighted in Nibam Rabia and Bamang Phyllis judgment, which was again a case of Arunachal Pradesh. Now, all these aspects have been clearly highlighted in the notes for which you can uh, go through the telegram channel, which has been provided here. Right. So, this news on page number one and in the editorial section highlights that even though it is mandatory for the governor to heed to the advice of his cabinet or the council of ministers, yet the governor has not called for the session. And as we have seen that six months, the session must be called between six months or six months shall not intervene. But the governor has said that because of the situation in Manipur, um, some of the Cookies tribe or other tribe will not be able to convene. So let's see what happens. But from my exam perspective, we need to know these two provisions that is Article 174 and Article 85. Another interesting fact is that the Nibam Rabia judgment has been <clears throat> the Chief Justice of India in the Shiv Sena crisis case has referred the Nibam Rabia judgment to a larger seven judge constitution bench and the points on which the CGI has referred this judgment becomes interesting and when the judgment comes obviously we will discuss it in the DNS. So look just let's go through the points on which the CGI has referred the Nibam Rabia judgment to a larger bench and the judgment referred here is Subhash Desai versus Principal Secretary Governor of Maharashtra and others. So he says that CJI's bench, while hearing the Shiv Sena political crisis issue, referred this judgment to a larger bench. The reason, the first reason was, according to Kihoto Holohan versus Dachilu. Do you remember this judgment, Kihoto Holohan judgment? It was the judgment where the 10th schedule of the Indian constitution regarding the anti defection law was declared as constitutionally valid. Yet, the aspect of judicial review was, uh, it stated that the court does not have power of judicial review, which was taken away. So, it says that according to the Kihoto Holohan uh, versus Zachilu regarding the 10th schedule, the court cannot interfere in the interlocutory stage of disqualification proceeding as per the 10th schedule. So, the court can only intervene, suppose, against a MLA, a proceeding under 10th schedule has started. So, the court can only intervene after the speaker has given the order. This is what the judgment in Kihoto Holon highlighted that the court cannot interfere in the interlocutory stage of disqualification that is in the middle stage of disqualification as per the 10th schedule 
एज पर निबाम राबिया डिसक्वालिफिकेशन प्रोसीडिंग्स वुड बी स्टॉप इफ अ नोटिस ऑफ इंटेंशन टू रिमूव द स्पीकर हिमसेल्फ वॉज फाइल्ड तो दीज टू प्रोविजन आर अगेंस्ट वन अनदर दे डू नॉट गो साइड बाई साइड दे कट आउट इच अदर बिकॉज ऑन वन हैंड इट इज सेंग दैट यू कैनॉट इंटरवीन एनी डिसीजन रिगार्डिंग द टेंथ शेड्यूल अनलेस द स्पीकर हैज डिसाइडेड वेर एज ऑन द अदर हैंड यू सेंग दैट इफ अ केस इज फाइल्ड अगेंस्ट द स्पीकर हिमसेल्फ देन फाइन द स्पीकर के नॉट मूव फॉरवर्ड सो बोथ इन अ वे कॉन्ट्रोडिक्ट इच अदर and that's why this aspect has to be further relooked from a constitutional perspective so this is the first reason why nebab rabia judgment has been further sent to a larger bench the second point is that supreme court in nebab rabia failed to consider the possible misuse of this decision that is this contradicting decision so this aspect was not looked into the nebab rabia case and that's why it's necessary to look into that case so it says that mlas undergoing this qualification would simply file a notice of intention against the speaker and stop the proceedings <coughs> so suppose if a mla is undergoing 10 schedule uh, anti defection proceedings then very it is very easy for him or her to file a <coughs> defection case against the speaker himself or herself and hence the whole proceeding stops so this aspect needs to be looked into further says that disabling disabling the speaker would take away the role of the speaker as a tribunal now we all know that tenth under the tenth schedule the speaker function as a tribunal almost as a quasi judicial authority and hence his authority would be undermined and these aspects were not considered in imam rabia judgment and this larger bench will further look into all these constitutional issues so these are the issues which you just uh, need to know because recently this judgment of uh, shubhas desai versus principal secretary and uh, <clears throat> the governor of maharashtra was passed by supreme court of india any doubts so far in this speaker ka decision can be reviewed see that's what the case is earlier the kyota hall on judgment said that till the time speaker is giving or deciding on the anti defection case so suppose disqualification started for this person and the speaker gave a judgment suppose it started on 1st of jan and speaker gave its judgment on 1st of march now on 22nd of february one mla or this person against whom the disqualification proceeding is going on files a case of disqualification against the speaker herself this vitiates the entire process right so this is what the problem this is what the constitutional problem is and this is what the larger bench will actually address so let's wait for the judgment okay moving to this article this article has appeared in the indian express it is how to fix holes in the financial safety net now whenever a country faces financial problems they go to an institution such as imf to bail out or to get certain financial help when uh, india was close to defaulting in the early 90s we also approached imf and imf provided us loan but this article suggests that of late many countries particularly the emerging emerging countries or developing economies they are not uh, they do not prefer to go to imf two reasons more or less the first reason is that imf imposes strict conditions with respect to providing those loans so countries generally 
do not want to go to IMF or especially the emerging economies who do not have that much of a stable income, that much of a stable revenue for themselves. And the second reason why some developing economies or develop, uh, underdeveloped economies hesitate or do not want to go to IMF is that they do not consider IMF equal enough to because of their inadequate representation in the IMF. They do not want to approach IMF. So these are the two major reasons as to why it has been seen that off late emerging economies rather go for alternate options to fix their financial woes. These other options are first what they do is that they increase their own forex reserves. So that in case such a situation happens, financial crisis happens, they have enough cushion where they can rely on, where they can bank upon. And if not, then they go for alternative mechanism. Now this alternative mechanism is either to go to any other financial institution or to go for currency swap exchange. Now if the financial situation of a country is declining or deteriorating, that it is bound to, it is generally observed that the value of their currency also depreciates, right? Suppose a country uh, dollar exchange rate is say 70 for a particular country and because of the declining situation, uh, emerging financial crisis for that country, the dollar further becomes 100. So it becomes very difficult for them to take loan for that country. So what they do, they find an alternative mechanism whereby they could fix or they could make this exchange rate stable. Not fix, but make the exchange rate stable. And this is basically, with, this is an agreement between two countries. This agreement has reached between India and Sri Lanka and India and Japan that we will help each other out in terms of crisis based on certain fixed exchange rate. So the news says that how to fix holes in the financial safety net. The safety net here mentioned is this. So it says that in absence of significant governance reforms, effectiveness of global financial safety institution is eroding. India is better off relying instead on pursuit of prudent macroeconomic policy. Basically not relying on IMF. This is exactly what we were discussing in the first article. What should India do? How to balance out institutions favored by the United States and institutions favored by where China and Russia is there. Because if we support either of them, the other will view us in a susceptible manner. We'll look into this question first look into this why countries do not want to go to imf because of their stringent loan conditions or stringent requirements so it says that some of the lending tools of imf are rapid credit facility rate to deal with urgent balance of payment crisis on account of price rise disasters etc standby credit facility short-term loans provided by imf for less than three years, it is the main lending tool of IMF and extended credit facility. Long term loans for more than three years and less than five years. So these three tools of IMF to which they provide to countries for uh, to overcome the balance of payment crisis is rapid credit facility, standby credit facility and extended credit facility. Now look into this question asked in the prelims of 2022. Rapid financing instrument and rapid credit facility are related to the provisions of lending by which of the following? Options are Asian Development Bank, International Monetary Fund, UNAP and World Bank. I am sure you know the answer. The correct answer here is B, IMF. So very simple questions are asked by UPSC but for that you have to know the basics. So, 
this article highlights two important aspects first i think we have discussed this two major issues faced by uh, emerging economies is that conditionalities attached by imf are very stringent and uh, it becomes very difficult for them to repay back the loan and uh, they're not <clears throat> and they do not want to enter into such stringent conditions such countries do not want to enter such stringent conditions and inadequate representation in imf particularly uh, some emerging economies do not view imf as an equal or equitable representative institution alternate arrangements accumulation of forex reserves and bilateral currency swap agreements having fixed exchange rate so that they do not have to you know face the problem of the volatility of deteriorating currency especially with respect to the exchange rate hence they fix the exchange rate to minimize the damage which could have done with respect to the declining exchange rate so now uh, this is an interesting uh, graph as you see it shows that it highlights imf in a navy blue dot and as you can see that earlier 1995 96 2002 2006 7 there was only imf but now this light blue institutions have emerged which is regional financial arrangements so the countries are now also opting for other alternatives in case of a balance of payment crisis or other financial crisis and the yellow one is bilateral swap arrangements and of late this bilateral swap arrangement has also seen a tremendous increase so now countries are not only going to imf but are also going to these regional financial arrangements and also opting for bilateral swap arrangement india particularly has opted for bilateral swap arrangement with japan and also sri lanka is this topic clear shall we move ahead moving ahead this is the last topic uh, this talk about a uh, very simple topic talks about again the asymmetry between trade between india and asean countries and here uh, as you can see in this table it says that India and the ASEAN countries reached an agreement to review their free trade pact for a goods and set of 2025 goal post for concluding the review aimed at addressing the asymmetry in bilateral trade. Now just look at uh, this asymmetry. For the year 2022-23, the overall India ASEAN trade was 131 billion dollars. Export was worth 43.5 billion dollars and import was worth 87.5 billion dollars. So clearly, import is way greater than export. And if we see in 2010-11, 11-12 years back, overall trade was 57 billion dollars. Export to ASEAN from India was 25.6 billion dollars and import was 30.6 billion dollars. So the percentage of this gap has increased. And that's why this trade deficit with the ASEAN countries has overall increased. And one of the major reasons include greater imports of electronic products. We have already seen in the PLI scheme. Those components are coming from Southeast Asian countries and other countries of the smartphones. Imports of metals, particularly copper wire and imports of bituminous coal. And India's trade deficit has increased with Vietnam, Indonesia and Malaysia. Now, UPSC has started asking uh, questions based on statistics. So, questions uh, with respect to trade deficit with ASEAN countries may be asked. For the rest, you can go through the PDF. I hope this discussion uh, was more elaborate. You were able to, you know, it was more engaging. You were able to understand more. But you can definitely give your comment. Uh, what I can see is that you guys want the old format. Uh, if I go through your So, uh, see, uh, we are also trying to find out that whether this format is better or the old format. Ultimately, what we seek is the betterment of our students. If the students feel that old format was better, they were more relying on that format, then we, we would definitely think about it. But for those of you who think that this is more engaging or uh, it keeps us, as you said, that it keeps us on our toes, 
and we are very serious about it. We are always serious about DNS. That's why we have started this uh, experiment, as you can see, to you know start this live session. But ultimately, you are the audience. It is made for your benefit. And if you are not benefited, then we'll definitely shift to the old format. But at least uh, let's give it a chance and you know decide wisely. Any questions from today? I hope you like the discussion, this class format. Okay then. No questions? You like the session? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.